So Armenia is in one of the most critical stages of its history, but Armenian politics has never been so polarized and so heated. However, what will the future face of Armenian politics look like? What will the transition be? And what will be the next stage of Armenian political history? I'm joined by Civilnet host and analyst Eric Akopian for another podcast to discuss this and more. My first question, Eric, thank you very much for joining me, is is the revolutionary stage of Armenian politics over? Yes, it ended on uh, June 20th of last year. Okay. Uh, the elections of last year were the last act of the revolution because it essentially uh, closed the door on the old regime mm -hmm. for the most part and its primary figures from coming back to power. So the revolution, I think, ended then. It's done. And it certainly ended after all of our geopolitical border issues because uh, the focus of the country has moved on from uh, what happened in 2018. And 2018 at this point might as well be 1918 mm. in real terms. And I mean, the revolution and the prime minister, Nikol Pashinyan, can be synonymous to some, but not synonymous for others. For some, he's a messianic figure who is here to save the country. Others hate him so much that they believe he colluded with Azerbaijan and Turkey against Armenia. Eventually his rule will end. What sort of figure do you think will replace him? I mean, if you're gonna come up with a profile of someone who's gonna replace him, it's gonna be someone who <clears throat> supported the revolution, was part of, par partially, possibly even part of his team, uh, and is supported by, uh, or is in league with, uh, people in the tech industry here okay. uh, or people in uh, whatever businesses businesses here that are not tied to the old oligarchic system mm. so uh, and most importantly uh, whoever that person is uh, they're gonna have a far more <clears throat> aggressive stance on both nationalism and uh, in rebuilding the strength of the country in, in the military terms. Uh, we're gonna slowly see what I call the Israelization of Armenian politics in which the primary issue is, is gonna be security above all else. So first, if you're a serious candidate, you'll have to establish yourself as a credible person who can defend the country and then you move on to other issues. Or do you think in a sense that the issues of yesterday or today, as those kind of dissipate, new issues will come to the forefront? I mean, what kind of issues do you think these political forces will organize around? I think it's going to be uh, competence because everyone recognizes that the state itself is not competent. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons that I said people will come out of the private sector because the private sector for the most part uh, at least in certain sectors is, is perceived to be competent and in certain sectors is perceived to be very competent. So the first issue is going to be competence. Second issue is going to be security. Uh, it's, the, it's the credibility of uh, <clears throat> are you strong enough? Are you tough enough? Uh, I think uh, the next, whoever comes next will be, you essentially take Nikol Pashinyan and you deprogram them him to be the opposite of him. Mm. in that sense uh, and lastly is someone who can keep economic growth going so it's security strength competence and keeping economic growth going over the next five ten years and do you think that force exists today or has it not been formed yet it, it exists today but it doesn't exist in a formal matter as, as a political party but I, I think if there's if there's going to be any new elections over the next six months to four years, whatever the timeline is of this current government. Uh, at that point, we will have a real opposition, mm. uh, which will probably be out of the ranks of people who supported the revolution or even from inside of uh, Pashinyan's own party, people who have broken away or have left or people who will make the case that, yes, we support the revolution, the changes that came after it, uh, you know, demonopolization, we have no ties to the old regime, but <clears throat> what we have right now is unacceptable and we could do much better. Mm. That's it, gonna be the primary narrative. In our last podcast, we spoke a bit about the classist nature of mm. Armenian society, something I think uh, people oftentimes miss. 
Pashinyan really managed to capture the working <coughs> class vote in a way no other political figure has managed to. There is this elite versus proletarian divide in Armenian politics, and I feel that this phenomenon needs to be understood. My question is, does a new force in Armenian politics need to understand this dynamic, need to understand this, di uh, this phenomenon, and understand why poor rural voters are so behind Pashinyan and his party? Well, if, if they don't understand it, they don't win. So they have to understand it. Um, the opposition to the prime minister, you know, will be urban, will be younger, will be better educated, will be higher income. Mm. Uh, however, you cannot win with that. You you need, uh, in, in this country, you're going to need working class voters and you're going to need uh, rural voters. Uh, now, why that support exists for him, uh, I think it's the... Uh, for the force for the force for the most part it exists because of the just the, the pathological hatred that people have of the old regime and what they lived through for 30 years and a thousand one humiliations that they went through as citizens in a country where their rights were not respected uh not that everyone's rights are respected now but you know people have higher aspirations of you know as, as citizens so uh, that's one uh, now the, the more time passes the more secure those people are in those, you know, in, in their citizenship, they, mm -hmm. they can be far more liberal and looking for competence and other things. Uh, especially if they, you know, if, if they fear, they, they don't have the fear of the old regime coming back, then it really becomes a new politics. Uh, it's the, Pashinyan's hold on rural voters needs to be understood in very clear economic terms. And, and that is, uh, uh, economic growth for the first time is really penetrating some of these areas and the sort of the lifting of the feudal system in rural areas and essentially allowing people to own their own businesses and do whatever they can to help their families <coughs> uh, is very helpful and there's been actually programs which are quite successful in providing low interest or no interest loans for many years that are sort of you know wherever you go there's hot houses and uh, things are going up, land, you know, you see places being, uh, land being worked that were never worked before. And frankly, some of these systems actually started prior to this government, but this government is getting the credit for it. So uh, there's real terms for that. Uh, and that lifting of the feudal system is, he is credited, the prime minister is credited for that. Uh, and I think rightfully so, because the one thing he's been successful at is to dismantle old systems he's been entirely incapable of creating new ones. Mm. And do you think that he almost relied on fear of a return of the old regime to ensure his support base? Absolutely, absolutely. I think one of the biggest mistakes uh, that the opposition made in the last election is to uh, hold that humongous rally that they did. They had a huge rally, mm -hmm. I think two or three days before the election. Which, Much bigger than Pashinyan's yeah, rally. Uh -huh which, uh, I mean, there were many people there who were there by choice, and some people were there because they were asked to by their employers, but, you know, it doesn't matter. It was a significant number of people. And I think that scared a lot of people who were going to be voting for non, uh, non my step Nikolian Pashinyan party to say, oh, shit, you know, uh, you know, these guys might come back. And uh, it probably cost one or two parties... Uh, I specifically Lusavur and uh, the, uh, uh, the Lusavur, the Edmund Marukian party, mm -hmm. a chance to get into parliament because people just went and voted uh, for the current government, even though they don't love it, because they, they actually feared the return of uh, the old regime. And as the threat of the old regime uh, recedes, doesn't that kind of leave Pashinyan outflanked? Yes, he's exposed. Now he has to deliver and uh, the boogeyman is gone or marginalized. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, they, the, the opposition, the, even the parliamentary opposition today is the, you know, the best gift that he has uh, because by any measure, they're always more unpopular than him and they don't really provide any kind of a realistic alternative. Do you think they'll start to understand that, that actually probably the best way to get rid of Pashinyan is for them to kind of take a step back? No, no, no because uh, politicians everywhere in the world have huge egos and they can never imagine themselves as the problem. 
And what do you think Pashinyan's legacy will be? Two things, uh, winning the revolution and losing the war. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really, I mean, it, that's already written. Uh, well, if he stays five, 10 years, it could be a different thing. He mm -hmm. could be the person who rebuilt the army. He could be the person that, you know, oversees many years of economic growth. But right now, it's winning the revolution and losing the war. Even though you can argue back and forth about his responsibilities, it doesn't matter. Because mm. uh, if you're the leader, you get credit for good things that happen that you don't have anything to do with, and you get blamed for bad things. And obviously, he had, he, he was involved in decision making that led to, to defeat. However, you want to look at it. So that, those are the two things. Some names are being touted. I want to go through some names, and you tell me what you think. These are names of people that. Uh, some would say may one day lead Armenia. The first one is been in the headlines for the past few days and is really causing a lot of noise in Yerevan, and that's Yerevan Mayor Haik Marutian, who was initially a very close ally of the Prime Minister. He is now in a very public feud with the Prime Minister and his team, but he remains one of the most popular political figures in the country and is considered competent by many of Yerev Yerevan's residents. So what do you think about a future Marutian administration? Uh, I don't think it's out of the cards at all. And this move against him, and they're actually, uh, they're moving on the council, the city council, which is dominated by Pashinyan's party, is moving to impeach him. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, politically one of the, the stupidest, most tone deaf moves that you can make. Uh, the rule of democratic politics is uh, uh, it's if you have effective or popular people, you want them uh, inside of the tent pissing out rather than outside of the tent pissing in. And uh, what they might be doing if they get rid of him when he's popular and competent is, you know, he could become uh, uh, the sort of the non-alcoholic version of Boris Yeltsin to Pashinyan's Gorbachev where you out this very popular person who becomes the the per the, the person that any opposition that is smart will rally around. Mm. Uh, he is perceived to be competent. He has actually solved two, I mean, the, the, the city has a million problems, but he has solved the trash problem. That's yes. the perception. And he is greatly improving public transportation systems. You, and you see it driving. One of the good things about municipal politics is you actually see the result of someone's work. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the old, decrepit, ugly marshrutkas are going away and being replaced by modern buses, which, you know, if you close your eyes, it could be Vienna or uh, London or New York. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's stupid to pick a fight with him. Uh, it tells you about their level of uh, paranoia or unsophistication, mm -hmm. but they could be creating an opposition. They could they could do for the opposition something that they could never do for themselves, is to create a, a popular figure that uh, has a track record to run on. Mm -hmm. And in countries that are capital-centric, the mayor of that big city is always, always in line to be the next leader. Mm -hmm. Look at Jacques Chirac in France. That's it's, it's a normal progression so it's a stupid move boris johnson yeah yeah, yeah. well i i want to use the, the more positive example. <laughs> um you've spoken in the past about the need for a healthy opposition this news in the long run could this be a good thing yes absolutely we you know you, you need uh, uh you need a competent opposition that uh is 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 just about the future and not about the past Mm. And uh, this is actually quite a healthy development. This is not, uh, I don't see it as a negative. I mean, I think the act is a, is a stupid and negative thing and it's not helpful. But uh, for healthy democratic politics, you need uh, an opposition that is credible, that isn't, you know, uh, sort of a motley crew of, uh, you know, uh, discredited figures. Mm. And another name that's been touted is philanthropist Ruben Vartanyan, who has been involved in a number of initiatives in Armenia for a number of years. He recently st stated that he is ready to be a leader for Armenia, and, but prior to that, there was a lot of speculation mm -hmm. about this. So what do you think about that? What do you think of Ruben? Well, I, I think very highly of him as an individual. Mm. Well, I think he is, uh, I've always called him our number one citizen, as many people were critical of him, but he's one of the few Armenians with a lot of uh, 
wealth or assets that I've actually spent considerable amount of it. Maybe you don't agree with every project, but no one can question his uh, heart or his motivations. I, at least I don't. Uh, however, he'll have one problem, which almost every uh, business person uh, or wealthy person, specifically that stick to business, have in entering politics is uh, politics frustrates people who come out of the business sector because business, for all of its problems, it has a level of meritocracy in it. Mm. Uh, politics is not a meritocracy. In fact, sometimes it's the opposite. So they get frustrated or having to deal with idiots. Mm. Uh, and I don't know if they have the, the patience to deal with idiots. So they end up more often than not burning out and not uh, being frustrated political figures. So I think his problems are not about him. It's about the universality of people like him everywhere who mm. get frustrated by political systems that are very slow bureaucratic and uh, first and foremost want to you know stop any change mm -hmm. because change is not is not in the benefit of the bureaucratic class anywhere mm -hmm. uh, or the certain cases the business class so uh, I think highly of him as an individual do I think he will be necessarily successful in politics uh, that time will tell mm -hmm. And in terms of Mr. Vartanian, something you hear a lot on the streets of Yerevan are people, especially those who are apathetic towards politics in Armenia, saying that someone needs to come from outside Armenia. Doesn't he kind of epitomize that that idea? Yeah, yeah I mean, he is, you know, he, he essentially comes out of uh, Russia. Uh, he has connections he has around connections, the world. He has connections around the world. Yeah, he, th 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 there is that element that has always been there that, you know, uh, local people or local political scene can't fix the country's problems. So you need someone who is outside of it. And there could be truth to that, but they could also be, uh, it could also be somewhat wishful thinking because just because someone, uh, systems are always stronger than people. So you could have someone coming from someplace else and in, in, in due time, the systems suck you in and make you one of them. Hmm. You mentioned it could be someone from Pashinyan's inner team. What about an Arsen Torosian or a Tigran Avinyan? Uh, well, both of those, frankly, are capable individuals. Uh, I don't see them uh, being that leader in the short run because they're not in positions to do that. Mm. But uh, the one thing that is very clear is, uh, you know, we're, on some level, we've paid the price for the youth and experience of everyone. There's a whole cadre of people around Pashinyan, late 20s, early 30s. And in some ways, we pay the price for their inexperience, uh, which is natural given the fact when you have revolutionary change. However, what that means is that, you know, when these people are uh, 10, 15 years from now, you have a large political cadre who have far more experience than other people their age. Hmm. Uh, I think a lot of our leadership issues will be gone once this current generation of under 30s become 40. Hmm. So I think those two individuals are perfect examples of that because they're one of the few individuals around that Pashinyan team that have actually grown on the job and yeah. have become more worldly sophisticated and relevant. Young guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very smart. Mm. And are there any names that you would like to tell uh, that I haven't mentioned? Amane Tandilian. Yeah. Mane Tandilian uh, has been a minister in Artsakh, was a former minister of labor and social affairs in Armenia. Uh, sh she is uh, also considered a competent figure. She is, and uh, she also comes out of tech. She used to work at Synopsys, so she has a tech connection. She's young, smart, uh, strong political figure. You know, being a woman is a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have the issue of novel, you know, you, it, there's a novelty factor with that, and so you actually get more attention. But given the... Uh, you know the the sort of very sexist nature of our political culture. She will also be, you know, every part of her life will be examined, and how she dresses will be examined. You know, yeah. No one cares how, uh, you know, what suit Kochayan wears, or uh, you know, uh, about Pashinyan's haircut. But they will talk about all of stuff like that about her. But that's pretty much regular fare for any woman in politics anywhere in the world. I mean, you can list the incompetent politicians of Armenia and they're all men so yeah. maybe it's time for a woman oh, leader <laughs> by far that's not that's not that's not debatable here um the issues of tomorrow you've said that there will be a shift 
uh, towards issues of security, national defense, but also other issues. It's not just that. So can you speak a bit on that? What do you think the issues of tomorrow will be when the new stage of Armenian political history begins? The issues of the next 10 or 15 or maybe even 20 years, it's essentially four things. Uh, one is security. That's going to be the number one issue. Security of uh, Armenia proper and security of Arzakh, people living there. That's the number one issue. Number two issue is going to be uh, uh, economic growth and keeping it going. Mm -hmm. Because that is the one thing that can transform the country faster than anything else. Mm. Uh, you have uh, eight, ten years of economic growth like we've had in the last three or four years, minus the COVID war year, which is an exception everywhere in the world. You will have a different country in 2030. Uh, third one, which is not discussed, is the demographic uh, change, especially uh, immigration, uh, essentially foreign immigration, sorry, labor immigration to this country, which is growing around us and is not talked about, is not studied. But we know that there's large numbers of Indians, you know, everyone from the Philippines to India. I mean, you, you walk around and you see all kinds of people from everywhere doing all kinds of work mm -hmm. from construction to the highest end of uh, you know, food chain of jobs. And uh, the issue is, is this country ready to have uh, have, you know, 10, 12 percent of its population be non-Armenians? Because it'll be a different thing that we're not necessarily used to. And the last one, the fourth one, is what I call zero hour. And uh, zero hour is the is two things. It's the moment where the Aliyev regime ends. And we don't know when that is. It could be three years from now. It could be 22 years from now. You don't know. And that transition can happen in three days or it can happen in, uh, in, in a year. You don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but everything... Uh, that we do on a, on a geopolitical, military, or economic sphere has to be ready for that zero hour. Because mm. that zero hour most likely will bring chaos mm. regionally. And two, the next zero hour is when uh, there's a transition away from President Putin. Uh, he, he, there will either be an internal transition to someone else internally uh, from his team, or uh, you, the country goes in another direction. And that obviously have tremendous impact on us. Now, both of these things, we frankly have no control over, uh, yeah. none whatsoever. Uh, the only thing you can have control over is one, to be ready and have contingencies, two, and three, uh, be rich enough and strong enough to deal with it, because that's the key. You have to be rich enough and strong enough so that these changes don't affect you in a negative manner, mm. or in some cases, give you an opportunity uh, to actually advance your agenda. So it's those four things. Mm. Those are the issues the next 20 years. I mean, this is interesting. Let's go through them individually. I mean, if we're talking about political divides in the future, I mean, what do you think will be the discussions that Armenians will be having about security and national defense in the coming years? I mean, it's not that hard. You have to have a military that can defend the basic borders of the country. This is not rocket science. You need to rebuild the army in a manner that the country's borders are secure. Simple as that. But there will be consensus on that. There's right? absolutely consensus on that. Mm. But consensus does not mean action. Right. Uh, so yes, there's complete consensus. And then from there, you move on to the long-term security of people in Arsa, which is, I think, a diplomatic issue. Mm. Uh, is, you know, what can you do on a diplomatic front to secure that? Because mm. no one wants war. You know, that's, that should always be the last option. And, and from a security perspective, if that's not an option, you need to build a military strong enough to actually have the ability to defend the people of Artsakh once again, as we did for many years until we found out last year that we couldn't. So that's that's the defense thing. First, you start with Armenia proper, just to make sure that the country is secure. Mm. And security is not simply, uh, you know, uh, having people with guns at the border. Security is international relationships, it's economic strength, mm -hmm. uh, and even, you know, uh, negotiating with your enemies. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, secure, you know, strength has many different factors. It's not simply buying more guns or building more guns. So, uh, and obviously within this, the most, one of the most important things is to build our own military industrial complex. That's not even a question. Mm. And I think uh, that is a given. Uh, so I think that's the, that's the, so the security is, is that, securing the country, securing the rights of people in Artsakh. And uh, one day being able to actually defend the people of Artsakh on our own. Mm. That should be the goal. The second you said keeping 
this rate of economic growth going. You once even described the policies of the Pashinyan government as almost Thatcherite. They are Thatcherite. So going into the future, I mean, do you think they, they are going to remain so? Or do you think that there's going to be a change in the way Armenian politicians try to maintain this, this level of growth? I think there's going to be an... Uh, and you're already seeing this, uh, the introduction of what I call social democratic measures. I mean, uh, almost any family that is uh, poor gets some level of state support. It is nothing comparable to uh, what you have in Western Europe, obviously. Yeah, but they're trying but to increase it as well. They're trying to increase it. So yeah. I think there's going to be you know, the basic temptation of politicians is to, you know, uh, you build constituencies by, you know, making sure that every rural family that's got five kids gets an extra 50,000 drums or 100,000 drums mm -hmm. a month. And you will be rewarded for that during the elections. Mm. So I think that uh, that is there. Uh, but I think uh, one of the good things about having an incompetent state is that they're not really capable of interfering with the economy in any real way uh, because they're not organized enough to interfere. Uh, and given that the, uh, you know, certain sectors are really, you know, uh, not really tied to the local economy. It's actually part of the ecosystem of the uh, of the world, the world economy. And I think this gig, uh, you know, gig, the gig economy, which is destroying the middle class in uh, good parts of Western Europe by turning people who are making three, four thousand dollars or euros into people who are making fifteen hundred dollars doing odd jobs. Uh, is creating a middle class in places like Armenia, not just Armenia, because $1,500 in Berlin makes you poor. $1,500 in Yerevan makes you upper middle class. Mm. So I think uh, in some ways the economy is beyond the grasp of the government. Uh, on some levels, they can be helpful. Uh, infrastructure spending, things like that. Uh, limiting corruption limiting monopoly destroying monopolies uh, i don't want to discount the state sector's importance but uh almost all the good things that have happened in the economy in this country don't really have much to do with the state they only have to do with the state in which the state didn't interfere with that sector mm -hmm. whether it's tourism whether it's uh which is quite fat right it nature. is it is very, <laughs> it's very fat right uh whether it's tourism whether it's tech whether it's even the wine industry for example yeah uh so I think that's, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, the, the Armenians, many Armenians are very demoralized, very concerned about what's going on at the border, what's going on in Artsakh. But the economy after the war, I don't think anyone really expected this rate no. of recovery. Do you think that the Armenian economy really has the potential to continue this level of economic growth? I'm, I'm, I'm not an economist, but if you look at the indicators, uh, I mean, the entire country is a construction site. Uh, biggest issue is lack of labor, which is a hell of a good sign for a, a developing economy. It's usually not the case. Yeah. Uh, do we know if it will continue? Obviously, this country's economy, all the entire world economy outside of the North Koreas and the Cubas of the world is entirely integrated. It's becoming integrated. So obviously what happens around the world will have great impact. Mm. But I think uh, this this new, uh, the, the COVID world in which people get stuff done on, the, on a distant and the, your location doesn't matter has actually been quite helpful to Armenia. Yeah. Uh, and, and and again, not just Armenia, whoever was in the position to take advantage of that. And mm. we have more freelancers uh, on our own, on our side than most other countries, mm. because we've had to, because you've always made more money dealing with foreigners than you do with the internal market. Mm. So uh, it could very well continue, uh, uh, depending on what happens in the world economy. And uh, the thing to remember is that economic growth actually started under the last year of uh, Prime Minister Karpetian last year, of Serge's last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, then we had a little bit of a bump down during because of the revolution, and then it came back strong again. Mm -hmm. Now, what that tells you is that it's not the regimes that matter. There's underlying strengths there or underlying systems that for whatever reason uh, are generating growth. And what's interesting about it is that that's not driven by 
great amount of foreign investment because uh, this country doesn't get a lot of foreign investment in comparison to other countries. You get it in fits and starts, but then some of the industries that we're good at, foreign investment for the most part means you have a startup and someone gives you $20 million. Yeah, I mean, it's um, amazing that the tech sector, I mean, some of these uh, people started from really nothing, nothing and now are on Wall Street no. billboards. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a question of, uh, uh, this is never going to be a manufacturing center and you're not going to have, no one's going to build, you know, billion dollar Nissan plants here. So it doesn't work. That's not the, yeah. that's not the niche that we fit in. So you're never going to have that level of foreign investment. Uh, but I think the, the new world economy that is actually causing a lot of damage in the West is actually helpful to countries like Armenia. Mm. The next one you mentioned was demographic change, which a lot of people, it, it doesn't really spring to mind very fast. But I've noticed that you speak to some very intelligent people in Armenia and they will mention that this is a very critical issue. Can you tell us a bit more? Can you un unpack this for us? Why is this important? It's important is because uh, many of these people who come to work here aren't going to leave. Mm. Uh, some of them will leave, but some of them won't. So what does it mean 30 years from now uh, when uh, there's a Filipino family who's lived here for 25 years, who kids speak English, I mean, speak Armenian uh, better than me and you? And what are they, you know? How do you define the difference between nationality and uh, citizenship and ethnicity? Yeah. Which is not an issue that this country has had to deal with. I'm not convinced that they'll deal with it badly depending on who these people are. I think the key is the kinds of people you bring in and, and how willing they are to integrate. Mm -hmm. uh, and to be crass about it, sort of the religion of the people and how, you know, if you're bringing in Indians or, uh, you know, uh, Filipinos, it's different than bringing in Uzbeks, uh, which is different, you know, time. And you see that, you see, you know, there's Uzbeks in construction, there's Iranians in construction, there's Iranians in tech, even in restaurants, uh, Indians almost everywhere. Uh, so it isn't being talked about, but you, you, the key thing is to have a policy and a policy that uh, integrates people and does not allow ghettoization. I think that's the key thing. You, you don't want, you know, these ethnic ghettos. Mm. You want people integrated. And obviously it's going to take a, uh, you know, some people are very welcoming of this and some people hate it, but that's true anywhere in the world. Yeah. I mean, but the, the, the thing to understand is when business people need labor, they always win. They yeah. will find the people, uh, legal, illegal. They will find them. Uh, they always win. You know, if you go historically to Roman times, illegal aliens always win. They're winning today in the United States. So it's a, uh, it's a question of how do you manage it hmm. uh, and how do you integrate people? And you have, and obviously things have to be within limits. Uh, you don't want to become Dubai because this is, we're not that kind of country where 85% of people are going to be foreigners without any rights. Yeah. No, I mean, we're never going to get there. That's completely different. But just, you know, can you deal with 10 or 15% of your population not being Armenian? That's it. That's, that's a, I mean, I can't, I think we can, but it's not going to be flawless. It will come with its own problems. And the next one, uh, very interesting eventuality, the end of the Aliyev regime in Azerbaijan. Is it not better the enemy you know, or... Could this be almost an opportunity for Armenia? Uh, we don't know. You have absolutely no idea. First of all, again, we have no control over this. Second of all, we have no idea when this is going to happen, but it will happen. I mean, it's as, it's as consistent yeah. as saying there's going to be an earthquake somewhere. It will happen. No system like that ever survives for long. I mean, didn't long in a relative term, they don't, they don't survive forever. At some point, they're going to go. And if you look at history, the longer these systems stay, the greater the fall. Uh, and if you look at it to, in a world perspective, uh, in the non-monarchical, that's sort of the non-people, who countries that aren't monarchies, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's uh, Egypt, whether it's uh, the Assad's in Syria, whether it's North Korea, uh, where there's sort of, there's this, you know, royalty without having royals, 
mm. in real terms. Uh, the only country that's managed a third handoff has been North Korea. Everyone else has failed. Uh, or they never even got to it. They never got to the first handoff. The, uh, the Aliyev regime has made the first handoff. Uh, the second handoff, you know, he has serious succession issues. That's why his wife is vice president. Uh, his uh, son is reported to be autistic. No one has ever heard him speak. So obviously he's not going to be running the country. Uh, the two daughters are, you know, essentially social party figures. Yeah. And all, everything that goes with that. And Very well known in the nightclubs of yeah. the West End of London. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I don't know how credible women leaders are in a politically backward country. Mm. Uh, for long. I mean, they can rule for a time. Uh, so he has serious issues of who comes after. Uh, so this third handoff is going to be very problematic. And that's not even saying that, you know, he doesn't wake up one morning and there's some Turkish related general who's got tanks in front of his palace. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't know. Or a uh, revolution. Revolution. And then the, 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 the thing is that in a country in which there's no opposition, the difference is in Armenia, there was room for a Nikol Pashinyan, no matter what you think of him. Yeah. There was room for, because the system was not democratic, but it was not totalitarian. Mm -hmm. So there was room for opposition. There was room for opposition media. There were harassment here or there, but there was a level you could, you could exist and not be part of the system. In places where you can't exist and be there, and there is no other system, when change comes, it inevitably leads to collapse. You get Libya and you get Syria because the opposition doesn't exist. And uh, Azeri society is a clan-based family society. Uh, so what you're going to have is, you know, clan, clan type of breakdown. Now you could have one outstanding person that breaks through and unites everyone around another dynasty, but we don't know that. Most likely, it will lead to devolution and chaos. For a long period of time and devolution and chaos is going to drag in other regional countries into into it and it also creates the temptation to solve your problems by external warfare so that's why it's important for us so it's the, the most important thing for us is not to worry about what the hell happens inside of uh, Azerbaijan because we have no control over that it's to make a country that is wealthy and a country that is strong so whatever happens there whatever devolution happens there whether they become a continuation of what they are or they become Somalia, it doesn't affect you. That's the key. Mm. Should we take advantage of that? That, that really depends on how competent uh, the country is at that point. Mm. Okay. And in terms of foreign policy, foreign policy might change in the future and how Armenia approaches the nations of the world. Some people hope, some people really warn against it, but do you think Armenia is going to move towards the West in the future? Armenia is going to move towards the West culturally and economically, but not politically and militarily. Should it? I don't think it's our choice. Okay. And what about the relationship with uh, Russia? Could the country become like Moldova? or some other Balkan countries where the divide in terms of foreign policy is a anti-Russia or pro-Russia policy. I think it's different than, uh, we just need to be honest. Uh, Armenia at this point is, and to use the Cold War parlance, is a Finlandized country, okay? Finland. Finlandized, mm -hmm. you know, this is a term during the Cold War in which Finland was this neutral country that was not, uh, would never do anything against Russia yeah. or the Soviet Union, but they had their internal uh, they, it was a democracy. They ran their systems, but when it came to foreign policy, it was it was sort of what they would never be anti-Soviet, mm -hmm. and that's where we are. We have our internal politics, we have our internal democracy, we have our internal economy, but our foreign policy is limited. Mm. It's limited that it cannot be openly anti-Russian because of our security needs, yeah. and I think everybody recognizes that. And for the most part, is it a good thing? No, it isn't a good thing in, in a universal way. But uh, Finland in 1991 was a very wealthy, successful country, far richer than the Soviet Union. So who really won, you know, in that system? Hmm. Uh, so we need to understand uh, sovereignty for small countries is a, is, is a relative term. Hmm. 
uh, because uh, loyalty flows from the weaker to the stronger. It doesn't flow from the stronger to the weaker, and that's just reality. So the issue is how do you take advantage of the situation? Mm. Uh, but we are a Finlandized country, and I think we need to be very clear about that and understand the limitations, and other people need to understand those limitations. And we need to act accordingly. And the most important thing is to develop your country economically and get uh, wealthier and to have your political institutions be more competent. That's the most important thing because history changes. Mm. Times change. Nothing stays static. But uh, you need to make progress. And the variable is you want to be rich because if you're rich, you can be strong. Isn't it almost about juxtaposing all these different relationships, saying I can have good relations with Iran and Saudi Arabia, I can have good relations with Rus Russia and America? Well, we have, we're actually completely unique in that, completely unique, because we are the only country that have good relations with Russia, good relations with the EU, good relations. I mean, good relations doesn't mean they do things for you. It means they're not hostile. Yeah. We just need to be clear about that. We have good relations with almost almost every sector of the world except with our two neighbors frankly where it's awful yeah, yeah i mean we're we're, we're we're you know we're we're the only country that has good relations with iran and good, good relationships with the west I, you can't find too many countries like that like maybe except for Russia, you know and, and both entities don't have a problem with armenia having good relations absolutely. with the other yeah. yeah because they on they understand one they understand the limitations they also understand the opportunities mm. you know in a, in a perfect country an example of this is oman you know, it's the one country in the Gulf that has uh, traditionally good relationships with Iran and with everybody else, and they become the conduit. If you're smart, you can become the conduit between these different camps. Do you think Armenia could be the conduit between oh, these different well, camps? Well, one I mean, day? Uh, in, in an ideal world, yes. But do we do we have the the, the diplomatic or the political wherewithal for that? No, hell no. But mm. you know, yeah, is it a possibility ten years from now? Yeah, is it is it realistic today? No. Mm. And um, when democracy comes to a lot of non-Western countries, you see a period of, you know, ideas flowing. Uh, some would describe a sort of liberal period in these countries' politics. But oftentimes what we see in these countries is uh, these countries, which are traditionalist societies, is eventually a very socially conservative mm -hmm. politics coming to the forefront. We've seen this in Poland, Hungary, uh, in uh, Serbia. So uh, do you think one day, if Armenian democracy cements itself in the way it looks like it's doing, we will see a national and socially, socially conservative government in Armenia? I hope so. Not because I would support it, because that means you're rich enough to have the luxury of cultural wars. Yes. Cultural wars are the luxury. Cultural wars, Privilege. Are, cultural wars outside of the Muslim world uh, are the privilege of the rich. Or not, if not rich, the more affluent. Because you have to have, uh, you have to have your basic uh, needs met before you start hating gay people systematically. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. There's a. Because in the West, it's all about cultural war, uh -huh. war now. Yeah. Because, but, but that's a luxury of the rich. Yeah. So if we're actually having cultural wars, it's actually a good sign, not because... Because we're not hearing any of that in Armenia at the moment. No. Uh, I mean, listen, there, I think there, there might be some cultural... There might be some very unique... I mean, for example, in Georgia, who is in the same income levels as Armenia, there's huge cultural wars. Yeah. But then they don't have existential issues. Yeah. Uh, they're not fearing uh, ethnic cleansing and genocide. Whatever, whatever issues they have with the Russians, that's not, they don't fear that. So you have, they have the luxury of culture wars. We don't have the luxury of culture wars. And if one day we get around to having culture wars, it means that we've done well economically. Mm. And, you know, there's been a, a swirl of diplomatic activity as of late. Uh, Armenian Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan has now met three times with Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev. And uh, they have reached a consensus, an agreement on a southern railway. Mm -hmm. Um, Turkey, Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlut Cavusoglu also said that normalization talks will begin uh, between Armenia and Turkey and the Tur Armenian Foreign Ministry confirmed this. How do you think the, the developing nature of Armenia's, uh, Armenia's relationship with Turkey and Azerbaijan will fit into the next stage of Armenian politics? 
I mean, listen, I think there'll be, uh, it depends on what, what, what you mean by that. If, if it means you're opening up an embassy in, uh, in Ankara and there's a Turkish embassy in Yerevan, not much of anything. Uh, because then you, it's just an insider play where diplomats and politicians can talk to each other, and that's a good thing. Uh, railway openings, again, transportation, uh, again, railway openings between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia agreeing on railway openings, the winner is Armenia because we have a lot more, they, we have a lot more limitations than they do. So on the natural, we win that. That's not even an issue. Uh, what effect it will have, it, it depends on the scale of it. Uh, I'm skeptical of these things because you have a, a, a Turkey that is falling apart economically, literally on a daily basis. And uh, today as well, we're hearing that the lira again has plummeted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it, it, in the country is. Uh, I mean, to put things in perspective, uh, if you did the math, uh, Armenia. If you if you continued Armenia's economic growth and Georgia's actually economic growth over the next ten years, as it was in the previous ten, uh, both of whom and, and Turkey would have performed as as it has performed over the last ten years. Both of these Caucasus countries would have matched Turkish uh, per capita income in ten years. Uh, by next year, if the, if the lira falls under, goes into the twenties against the dollar, not because our living standards have gone up, but they were theirs would have collapsed to our level. Mm -hmm. uh, so that gap would be closed instead of in uh, ten years in one not by us getting richer necessarily, but by getting them getting poorer. Mm. So a country in that condition, uh, what, I mean, are they politically capable uh, to open up uh, uh, in more ways than one? I'm skeptical of all of these things because I think the incentive for them not to happen, given the fact that, for example, railroad openings are more favorable to us, the incentive for them not to happen short of intense pressure from the EU or Russians of other external powers, uh, the, uh, the Aliyev regime and the Erdogan regime have far less to gain by having these things open or having relationships with Armenia than the other way around. So I don't think at the end, I'm not optimistic about any of these things. Do you think in the future Armenian politics will be more civil? Because at the moment in parliament, we have two forces that quite literally hate each other and see the other as evil. No, they won't get any more civil. Uh, uh, is that just the nature no, of Armenians, it, or no? Uh, yeah, <laughs> because our uh, the discourse is the discourse does not allow for gray areas. Th th there's no uh, you're either a traitor or you're a saint. So th there's no nuance. There's no nuance, uh, and frankly, uh, I wonder how much nuance there is in the culture. So I I don't expect that, uh, but. I mean, if the country becomes more middle class, it becomes more affluent, then you have more perspective and it is not as extreme. But uh, this, it's, it's also the style of politics. You know, it's you, no one's going to stand up and say, you know, well, you know, a lot of street um, yeah, politics. It is. Well. It's like it's not a, no one will stand up and say, you know what, I, I respect the prime minister, but I can do a lot better. No, no, no. He's a traitor and I'm not. And it's the other way. And it's the same exact way, both ways. Both mm. sides are at fault. This is not any particular side's fault. It's a cultural issue, and I, I don't see it changing in the short run. I mean, in politics, it's quite accessible in that sense, though. In America and UK, politics almost seems like, seems like something inaccessible, closed off, and unavailable to the citizens. Yeah, no, no. It's uh, everybody and their brother-in-law can start a party. <laughs> Uh, and, and hold a rally. Yeah, and hold a rally. And uh, that's the sort of the uh, the anarchist collective in our culture where, uh, you know, why should the other person lead when I can lead? <laughs> uh, what kind of government, Eric, and uh, polis politics do you want to see in the future? Uh, in short, frankly, I, I want... Uh, the new and better people to uh, own and run the country. I, you know, I wish our tech people get active in politics and they're gonna own the country in a couple of years. I want them to run it. Mm. Uh, I mean, to be crude about it because they will be, you'll be coming out of people who are competent and come out of business ranks 
because if you come out of business ranks in, in Armenia, you're used to dealing with half the world. Uh, if you're in that business specifically, uh, you want uh, you know, you want a politics that's primarily focused on competence, uh, economic growth, and 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 state building, and whoever does that, uh, I'll be for. That's the ideal. Hmm. Uh, who is it likely to come out of? I think it's likely to come out of new forces, uh, rather than old forces who have obviously failed in different ways via different governments for the past thirty years, including a good part of this government. Is democracy a given? Do you think it's cemented? <sighs> it's a given if people are interested in you know it's uh, if they're interested in keeping it. Uh, Do you think they are? Do you think Armenian people oh, yeah. value democracy? No, I, I, I think you have to be careful. They don't value democracy. They value freedom. Okay. They're not always the same thing because no one trusted. Democratic systems make themselves uncredible very quickly because they're cumbersome and, you know, you want all the bad guys arrested in three minutes. And, you know, that, that it's not, uh, democracy is not swift. So uh, Armenia is a freedom-oriented culture. We don't do authoritarianism well. Uh, and uh, the more, you know, there's actually a formula. Once your, you know, your income level rises above a certain level, with rare exceptions, you're almost inevitable to have a democratic system of some kind yeah. with local varieties, except for the Chinas of the world. And China is entirely unique in so many ways. Uh, so, no, I think uh, Armenia is a, is a freedom. Uh, democracy is not a given, but the country having, uh, being a free country is a given. But those, because those two are not always the same thing. But in terms of Pashinyan, we spoke about uh, his successor. Do you think he is the sort of man that will hand over the keys? I have no idea. I've never, uh, I've never spent you know considerable time with him. You know, so I, have, I would have no idea. However, given the fact that you know his primary legacy is revolution and 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 the revolution uh, change reform and clean elections. If he loses and he doesn't want to go, uh, that one legacy that he has in history will be gone. Mm. And I think he cares about his legacy. Not that does not mean that if there's a competitive election, they don't bend the rules and try to use every state resource to win. Sure, but that's pretty much part of the course in almost any government and in any system, political system, especially underdeveloped ones like ours. Uh, but I cannot answer the question of what's going can, can he quickly turn into Shakashvili and go crazy and start shooting people in the street? Who knows? I, I, nobody really knows that. But uh, I mean, his government is willing at least to have uh, free elections. Yeah, I mean, there are people they lose all over the place when it comes to I mean, sometimes they react well, sometimes, you know, they, they don't, they but, don't. So yeah. but overall, do I see him blowing his last do I see him blowing his biggest legacy and not leaving? Uh, no, partly because of self-interest, because if you actually leave like that, you actually have the possibility of coming back. Yeah. While if you refuse to leave, you have no possibility of coming back. Hmm. Because even for all of his faults, he is still a very popular figure. I mean, you take Erdogan, for example, the country's e economy is in the toilet and there's still 30, 35% of people vote for him yeah. for, for cultural reasons or historic reasons. So he, he will always have a base. So I, I don't think he wants to sully that with, uh, with, with some undemocratic. Uh, uh, it also depends on who he loses to. Mm. You know, if he's losing to people who are you know, it's one thing losing to Kocharian and it's another thing losing to, uh, you know, uh, people who were your former who were ideologically that not that much dissimilar from you. Mm. And uh, you've mentioned that Armenia is one of the freest countries in the world. And that is very much connected to culture. And I think this is such an important point. And I think especially coming from a Western country, this is really noticeable. And you've spoken about the intactness of the social fabric of the country. I was speaking to Aspram Karpeyan, one of the new members of parliament of the parliamentary opposition. She is saying that in the future, that is all going to go. Do you think that that, that treasure we have in Armenian society 
is something that will remain but what was her what was the, the rationale i mean her she is obviously very very critical of this government and she sees the signs and the the way the directions the government is going in her opinion is going to result in uh, that intactness uh dissipating i'm asking what you think yeah, it's hard to say uh The culture changes very slowly. I think the one thing that's going to change, uh, I can change some of that, is you know the country, the culture of the country is becoming on the elite level far more westernized mm -hmm. uh, on almost all kinds of social issues. Uh, I think you're going to start having some of these culture war issues that will essentially break apart the sort of the some of those issues that seem to be settled and are not settled. Mm. or become unsettled and you see this all over eastern europe in poland and hungary and where there's a big difference between sort of elite big city culture and uh, traditional culture that wants to hold on to the old world uh, the one thing that's consistent with that is that the, the new forces even if they lose temporarily they'll, they'll they win because they're they're the future and they're younger and uh, the most powerful force probably the most powerful force in history outside of capitalism is modern popular culture and modern popular culture has crushed every old system that's ever been put in front of it and that's going to happen here and some level it is happening here hmm. and once that happens yes some of that cohesion will be gone but that some of that is a price you pay for development hmm. and you know armenians have a propensity some armenians not all of them uh towards conspiracy theories uh you know even this case we were talking about about haik marutian uh, the haikak anjamanak which is a newspaper owned by uh nicole pashinyan and his family was putting out news that uh haik marutian secretly met with pashinyan's arch rival uh, former president robert kocharyan you know this was misinformation according to marutian spokesperson according to kocharyan's lawyer misinformation disinformation uh circulating in uh, amongst armenians but also conspiracy theories i mean what do you think about these conspiracy theories some you hear that are i don't i guess you could say far-fetched well i mean there's multi layers to this first of all we need to acknowledge that there actually are conspiracies yes but that they're almost never secret okay uh, davos mm -hmm. is a conspiracy of the elite okay mm -hmm. The IMF is a conspiracy of the elite and the World Bank. It's designed to make sure that the, the, the whoever's on top and whoever's on the bottom, for the most part, stays the same. Uh, the EU, on some level, is a conspiracy, which is, you know, many people will say it's the German way of occupying Europe without shooting. Full, full so, <laughs> yes. So I think the uh, we need to, yes, there are conspiracies, but they're hardly ever secret. If you follow things, you would understand that they're not secret, but conspiracy in the sense that there's elites that get together and try to push an agenda. Uh, yes, there's plenty of conspiracies, but they're almost all understandable. When it comes to uh, sort of the other sense of conspiracies, I think there's two things. There's there's two other explanations. It's laziness mm. on one hand, and then I'll, let's go through this first. Uh, it, 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 conspiracies are a lazy person's way of understanding the world. Because if you really don't want to dig deep into things and understand how systems work, uh, and it's much easier to explain that you know there's uh, three financiers that get together and you know on a conference call and make all the decisions, and everyone is a puppet for them. The sort of the childish, stupid understanding of the world, and that's just simply laziness. I think the other part of it, which I think is the real part of it, is. Uh, people don't understand to the extent that the people in power really are not in control of things yeah uh, you're giving them a lot of credit they're, they're, actually they're they're not i mean <laughs> so it becomes uh people cannot imagine for example that some lone serbian nationalist you know uh, on his with his friends and starts shoots archduke Ferdinand on november you know in, in august of 1914 and starts world war one that defines the world for the next hundred years and it all started with this act of this one person so people don't understand that people have agency and that one crank, if the moment is pregnant enough, can create something. You know, the Arab Spring started with one person in a cart in Tunisia mm -hmm. committing suicide. 
I'm burning themselves. The Blue is easy, yeah. yeah. So there's this comfort, this comfort level of like, really, the emperor has no clothes and no one's in control. And decisions are made on incorrect information that the elites are not that smart, that even in authoritarian states, the systems of control are really not that much in control. Uh, so there's almost this fear factor of that there's no one running the show. So it's easy to explain things that, you know, well, you know, uh, Oswald really didn't kill Kennedy on his own because he had hated his Cuba policy. It has to be some convoluted plot that includes everyone from Mickey Mouse to Khrushchev, you know. So uh, it is, uh, it's this, this lack of uh, understanding that systems themselves are not very strong and that individuals uh, or small groups of people can change history. Mm. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, with that old line about it's always been small groups of people that have changed history. Mm. Uh, the Bolsheviks, you know, were a tiny group of people and they defined the 20th century. Mm. So uh, I think, again, for the, the conspiracy part that comes out of laziness, I have no patience for because that's just stupid. But uh, this other part where people are just have a hard time understanding that you these these supreme leaders and presidents and you know corporate executives that you think are all powerful, um, they end up being not as powerful as you think. Because you are in essence saying that they're extremely competent. Yes, they're not. <laughs> I mean, the, the government. I mean, look, look, look. I mean, we always talk about competence issues in Armenia, and, and we have more of it because it frankly matters more. But can you really look at? countries like in Western Europe, which are supposed to be far better run, or even China itself, who, you know, this mess started from, the COVID one, has any government been competent during the COVID period? Mm, yeah. You can make the case that the, you know, Germany has been incompetent. Uh, so uh, there's a competent, incompetence is the rule. It is not the exception, mm. except in a place like ours, the stakes are much higher. And isn't, in essence, that incompetence more concerning? Isn't that a more concerning reality that instead of them trying to it, it, do 9-11 and kill yeah. Princess Diana, they're yeah. in fact, they don't know what they're they doing. They don't know what they're doing. Because, <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, I can tell you from my experience in politics is in, 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 in 10 occasions, if you see something that doesn't make any sense or is, is just, it, 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 it confounds you, uh, there's nine chances that it is stupidity and incompetence and one chance that it is ill will of some kind. Because stupidity and incompetence are, you know, uh, ill will takes a lot of organization. Mm. Few people are, are, are that capable. So I think uh, the way you get away from conspiracy thinking is, is, not, is to understand that there are real conspiracies, but they're not secret. And secondly, it's to educate yourself as much as possible which most people are not interested in doing. So it's much easier to come up with plots and this and that. And uh, to, I mean, let's just take the, the basic charge against Pashinyan is that he deliberately lost the war. Let's yeah. just think about this logically. Treachery. Um, what politician in ish history has ever gained by losing a war? None. Uh, now, if you believe that, you know, someone put $5 billion in his account in the Cayman Islands, then, you know, you're so stupid that you're not even worth talking to, to be honest with you, because that's not how the world works. Mm. What motivates politicians is, it's not, you know, money is always the secondary thing. It's power, staying in power. How does losing Shushi help Pashinyan stay in power? Yeah. So I think it's, 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 it's you know, it's, it's a simplistic understanding of complicated things. Uh, and people's uh, lack of understanding that random events, uh, you know, uh, can have tremendous impact. You could have a natural disaster that no one controls, but the way you react to it shows the incompetence of the state that can bring down a government mm -hmm. five years later. So uh, it, we have conspiracies because people do not want to admit that the emperor has no clothes. Mm. Maybe it's a sort of comfort. Great. Great. Well, Eric, thank you as always. Thank you. And thank you too. <laughs>